premieră, nu cred să fi fost o ședință atât de matinală pentru decernarea acestui titlu în istoria Universității din Craiova și mulțumim Facultății de Științe că demonstrează că aprecierea de științe sociale, că demonstrează că aprecierea valorii nu doarme în această universitate. Motivul pentru care suntem astăzi aici este unul deosebit de important, pentru că Universitatea din Craiova, la propunerea Facultății de Științe Sociale, va acorda cât de curând titlul de doctor honoris causa unei personalități a lumii contemporane în domeniul relațiilor internaționale și a științelor politice. Lumea se schimbă, granițele devin fluide, destinul oamenilor se schimbă radical, imprevizibil, și toate aceste schimbări pun oamenii de știință într-o într dificultate a reflectării. Ei trebuie să fie foarte atenți la felul în care lumea se reconfigurează, astfel încât lumea să devină comprehensibilă și suportabilă prin înțelegerea ei. Profesorul Perry Bazin de la London School of Economics, membru al Academiei Engleze, este unul dintre cei care a demonstrat această curiozitate spectrală pentru tot ceea ce se întâmplă în lume, pentru multiplicitatea și dinamica relațiilor internaționale, astfel încât tot ceea ce a scris dumnealui, toată contribuția sa științifică, demonstrează că este un seismograf al lumii contemporane. Dar despre personalitatea sa, Laudatio o va ține domnul decan al Facultății de Științe Sociale, Vă rog foarte mult. Stimate domnule profesor emerit Beri Buzan, onorat prezidiu, distins auditoriu. La propunerea Facultății de Științe Sociale și cu acordul Senatului Universității din Craiova, i se acordă astăzi titlul de doctor honoris causa distinsului profesor emerit Beri Buzan, ilustru reprezentant al școlii engleze de relații internaționale și remarcabil specialist în domeniul studiilor de securitate. Berry Buzan s-a născut la Londra la 28 aprilie 1946, iar în 1954 a plecat împreună cu familia în Canada, astfel că, pe lângă cetățenia britanică, dobândește și cetățenia canadiană. A absolvit în anul 1969 cursurile prestigioase University of British Columbia în domeniul științelor politice și al relațiilor internaționale, iar între anii 1970 și 1973 a urmat studiile doctorale la London School of Economics, obținând titlul de doctor cu o teză consacrată politicii britanice de menținere a păcii și de asigurare a securității în perioada interbelică. The British Peace Movement from 1919 to 1939. Imediat după obținerea titlului de doctor, activează timp de 2 ani în domeniul cercetării la Institutul de Relații Internaționale din cadrul University of British Columbia, pentru că apoi să aleagă cariera de profesor la Departamentul de Studii ale relațiilor internaționale de la Academia Britanică. De asemenea, putem spune că domnia sa a parcurs toate treptele carierei didactice. Asistent în 1976 la Universitatea Warwick, unde își va desfășura activitatea, lector în 1983, conferențiar în 1988 și profesor din 1990. Începând cu 1995, își desfășoară activitatea didactică și de cercetare în domeniul studiilor internaționale la Universitatea din Westminster, iar din anul 2002 susține cursuri de relații internaționale la London School of Economics, la care activează și în momentul de față, primind titlul de profesor emeritus. Totodată este profesor onorific la Universitatea din Copenhaga și la Universitatea Jilin din China. De-a lungul carierei sale didactice, profesorul Berry Buzan a susținut numeroase prelegeri în mediul academic din diferite state europene, Statele Unite ale Americii, Mexic, Canada, Australia, Africa de Sud, Orientul Mijlociu și Extremul Orient. Deci, cum putem să observa, între globul. 
a fost de asemenea visiting profesor la Universitatea Internațională din Japonia, precum și Olof Palme, visiting profesor în Suedia. Investigațiile sale în domeniul relațiilor internaționale și al studiilor de securitate, concretizate prin publicarea a numeroase cărți și studii de specialitate, au contribuit la consacrarea sa pe plan mondial ca unul din cei mai reputați specialiști. Din 1988 și până în 2002, a îndeplinit funcția de director de proiect la Copenhagen Peace Research Institute și de asemenea a fost redactor și membru în colegiile științifice a prestigioase reviste de specialitate, printre care amintim Journal of Peace Research, European Journal of International Relations, International Relations of the Asia Pacific and World Economics and Politics. Ca o recunoaștere a meritelor sale de excepție în domeniu, profesorul Berry Buzan a fost ales președinte al Asociației Britanice de Studii Internaționale, 1988-1990, vicepreședinte al Asociației Nord-Americane de Studii Internaționale în perioada 1993-1994, secretar fondator al Comitetului de Coordonare a Studiilor Internaționale între 1994-1998, iar din 1998, membru al Academiei Britanice. De asemenea, din 2001, a fost ales și membru al Academiei de Științe Sociale din Marea Britanie. Printre direcțiile de cercetare ale profesorului britanic, enumerăm Aspecte conceptuale ale securității internaționale și regionale, relații internaționale din perspectivă istorică și evoluția sistemului internațional, conceptul de societate internațională și abordarea școlii engleze în domeniul relațiilor internaționale. Lucrările publicate de-a lungul timpului de către profesorul Berry Buzan au devenit lecturi obligatorii în domeniul științelor politice, relațiilor internaționale și studiilor de securitate. Cele mai importante au fost traduse și în limba română, astfel că ideile sale sunt cunoscute și discutate în mediul universitar, inclusiv cel craiovean. Una dintre teoriile lansate de profesorul britanic și care s-a impus la nivel conceptual este aceea de complex de securitate, este o idee pe care a dezvoltat-o în lucrarea sa, intitulată Statele, Popoarele și Frica, apărută în 1991 și utilizată pentru a studia și explica transformările suferite de Europa post-război rece. Complexul de securitate este definit, și citez aici din cartea profesorului Buzan, ca un grup de state ale căror percepții și preocupări majore de securitate sunt atât de interconectate încât problemele lor de securitate națională nu pot fi analizate sau rezolvate independent. Am încheiat citatul. Pe de altă parte, împreună cu alți colaboratori, precum Ole Weaver și Iap de Vilde, Profesorul Berry Buzan, în lucrarea colectivă intitulată Securitatea, un nou cadru de analiză, apărută în 1998, împărtășește o opinia extinderii din punct de vedere analitic și structural a studiilor de securitate, nu numai la sectoarele politice sau militare, cum este până acum, ci și la cele economice, de mediu sau societale. Într-un alt registru, a devenit cunoscută în întreaga lume lucrarea scrisă împreună cu fratele său, Tony Buzan, The Map Mind, este vorba de uh, hărțile mentale, tradusă în limba română și apărută acum doi ani de zile, prin care autorii propun cititorilor un veritabil sistem de planificare, aplicabil oricărui domeniu în care un individ dorește să se dezvolte, oricărei decizii pe care dorește să o adopte și oricărei probleme cu care s-ar putea confrunta, sistem menit a simplifica și dezvolta abilitățile organizatorice și creative. Vă invit la lectură. La Universitatea din Creova, în cadrul Facultății de Științe Sociale, există două programe de studii de licență consacrate pe de o parte relațiilor internaționale și studiilor europene, iar pe de altă parte științelor politice, dar și un program de master consacrat securității naționale și euroatlantice, 
unde studenții noștri dobândesc cunoștințele necesare în domeniu și învață să opereze cu acele concepte specifice la care și profesorul britanic și-a adus contribuția. Pentru a concluziona, menționăm că remarcabila operă științifică a celui omagiat astăzi și prestigiul său internațional au determinat acordarea titlului de doctor honoris causa profesorului emerit Berry Busan cu speranța unei fluctuase colaborări atât la nivel instituțional cât și științific. Bun venit, stimate domnule profesor, în comunitatea universitară Craiovan. Suntem toți convinși că avem alături o personalitate remarcabilă a lumii contemporane în ceea ce privește relațiile internaționale și științele politice în general, drept care îmi permit să dau citire diplomei de investitură. Quod bonum fortunatum Felix Sit, Senatus Universitatis Craiovensis, rectore magnifico Cezar Ionut Spânu, profesore publico ordinario, sumo omnium plausu de crevit, ut illustrissimus dominus, beri buzan, in corpus doctorum universitatis honoris causa reciperetur, in cuius rei fidem, hoc diploma conscribendum censui. Cesar Ionut Spânu, rector magnificus, Romania, datum Craiove, die vicesimo quinto, mensis octobris, anno domini, bi, anno domini bis milesimo decimo septo. Please. start by saying my uh, profound thanks to all concerned with uh, giving me this honor. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in Romania again. Uh, particular thanks to Florin who did all of the organizing for this and even managed a, a rather heroic drive through last night's uh, storm to, uh, to get us here on time. Uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, rising powers in the emerging world order. This, I'm not going to use a PowerPoint. Uh, I gather those of you who need translation uh, have it. Uh, I'm going to try and talk for about 40 minutes, so that should leave us time for, uh, for Q&A. This work, uh, it stems from the project that some of you may know that I did with George Lawson a couple of years ago, uh, and resulted in a book um, uh, about the global transformation which basically was arguing that the world we live in now um, is a world that was largely created and framed during the 19th century by the revolutions of modernity. These were social revolutions, economic, political, also technological, industrial revolutions, even psychological revolutions, that the world changed in very profound ways uh, during uh, the 19th century, and that that is the world that we live in now. That's when modern international relations was, uh, was created. So that book unfolds a, a, a driving mechanism um, and explains how we got to where we are. And uh, I think it also offers some ways of looking forward because it defines a set of momentums that suggest uh, where, where we might be heading. And, The talk I want to do today on rising powers in the emerging world order is both about that emerging world order and what it looks like, uh, but also about the, uh, the nature of the rising powers within it. Uh, I'm going to focus particularly on uh, uh, India and uh, China, and I'm not going to say much about Russia. I don't think of Russia as a rising power. 
that might be a controversial statement, and I'm quite happy to take that up and discuss it in, uh, in the Q&A, if, uh, if you wish. Right, so let me start first by looking at the, uh, the characteristics of this emerging world order. Uh, it seems to me, uh, as I say, this is driven by the revolutions of modernity, and essentially what's happened here is that in the 19th century, the revolutions of modernity were concentrated in a very small number of societies, uh, basically a few uh, Western countries and Japan, and those societies remade the world for their own convenience and in their own image, because they were immensely more powerful uh, than all of the rest. So international relations has been largely defined by the power gap between uh, the core, if you want to use that language, um, and the periphery that was set up during the 19th century. That power gap has lasted for nearly two centuries, uh, but it is now closing. When we talk about the rise of China and the rise of India, or um, in Sakaria's phrase, the rise of the rest, what we're talking about is the fact that more and more societies are coming to terms with the revolutions of modernity and are able to organize themselves and generate the wealth and power uh, that modernity offers. So where we are now, in my, in my view, um, is that we are uh, in the transition away from that period that started in the 19th century when uh, international society and international relations was dominated by a small group of developed countries and we are moving towards um, a, an international society which, in which wealth and power and also um, cultural and moral authority will be more widely diffused. In other words, we are moving into a post-Western era. Uh, the, the idea that uh, Western culture and liberalism in particular, have some kind of teleological grip on history and that all the world must end up looking like us uh, is not going to happen. Uh, because as the Chinese, with their uh, endless phrase, Chinese characteristics, suggest, uh, they're not going to end up looking like the United States um, or Europe. They're going to end up looking like something that is modern but distinctively Chinese um, and will have its, its own uh, its own characteristics. This suggests that the world we're moving to might be thought of using the idea of deep pluralism. Uh, by this I mean that there'll be no superpowers because wealth and power are diffusing. The United States is the last superpower. We, we started off with three and then we had two and then we had one and where we're going is none. Um, so we're going to be in a a different world from the one we've been in for quite a while, and one that doesn't lend itself to the existing framings of international relations theory. Uh, those of you who think uh, in neorealist framings, uh, polarity theory and all of that, this just isn't going to work because we're not going to be in a, 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 a multipolar or a bipolar world. We're going to be in a world which contains great powers but not superpowers, and therefore uh, the, the standard meanings of polarity uh, don't really work. This world will be defined by a shared substrate of modernity because all of the leading powers will in their various ways be modern, uh, but it will have a, a very different set of cultures within it. Some of those cultures that were uh, uh, suppressed uh, by uh, the power of the West during the last couple of centuries are now resurgent and they will begin to express themselves through modernity in their own way. So this is a world order that is likely to be a bit more regionalized, a bit less centrally uh, globalized than it was before, but it will remain highly interdependent. Uh, there's no escape from that. And therefore another feature of it will be that there will be a lot of shared fates uh, in the sense we are all embodied in the same global economy, we are all vulnerable to the same global diseases, we are all vulnerable if the internet collapses, uh, we are all vulnerable to uh, climate change, etc., etc. We're therefore remaining in an interdependent world, but 
one in which there will be more cultural diversity and uh, more diffusion of power. So in one odd sense, those who've been calling for a more multipolar world are going to get their wish. Uh, but this multipolar world is not going to look uh, like the one that they perhaps had thought about. And I'll try and say a bit more about that as I go on. I want to focus as well on the, the particular character of the rising powers, because it seems to me this is going to be um, important in the way we anticipate and think about the sort of world that we're moving into. And as I say, I'm going to focus mainly on uh, China and India, but much of what I say could also be uh, said, I think, for Brazil, if, if any of you think that Brazil is in the list of countries that might become great powers. It seems to me some way off, uh, but uh, I think a lot of what I say could apply there as well. But thinking mainly about India and China, um, these are very big countries in terms of large populations, large area. Um, and this means uh, that demography is back in international relations. In other words, that wealth and power um, are going to align themselves with population size, as they did in the pre-modern era, but as they didn't um, during the period of modernity from the 19th century, when a small country like mine was able to, to uh, dominate the world and occupy a quarter of it. Right? That, when you think about it, um, is, is ridiculous. Uh, I mean, that, that a small country like Britain could both put down a huge rebellion in India and beat up the Chinese at the same time in the middle of the 19th century without even breaking sweat. That suggests how big that power gap was that was created between those who had uh, the revolutions of modernity and those who didn't. And that is all now evening out. Uh, so countries like Britain are, uh, are going down and countries like India and China are coming up as uh, the revolutions of modernity are combined with large populations. Both of these countries are uh, strongly sovereigntist, they are nationalist, um, they carry quite big historical chips on their shoulders. Um, their nationalism has a strong post-colonial edge to it, um, whilst we in the West tend largely to have forgotten uh, colonialism and imperialism and racism and all that we did uh, during the 19th century. Uh, all of this is extremely well remembered in the countries on whom it was inflicted. And this is a problem in the world as we move forward. There's a great deal of historical resentment which is well remembered on one side and largely forgotten on the other. And this is going to create uh, political tensions. I think within this world, as I said, uh, shared fate issues are going to get more pressing. So although this is a world in which there will be wider cultural differences than there have been, um, in some senses there are less uh, ideological differences. Um, in, at the risk of pushing a point, I suppose we could say that we're all capitalists now. So whilst during the Cold War, indeed much of the 20th century, the issue was capitalism or not, uh, now it's simply what kind of capitalism. And in that sense, the ideological bandwidth uh, of international society uh, has narrowed quite considerably. It's still there in the sense of the tension between democratic and authoritarian states, uh, but the big ideological battles uh, of the 20th century seem largely to be over, and we are now all operating closer together in the form of political economy that we have. Not identical, but, but closer together. If I'm right that um, we are moving towards a world in which there will be no superpowers, then, but, but only great powers and regional powers, then there are some questions, quite big questions on the horizons about the management of global order. Uh, if there's no superpower, who looks after the global level? Uh, the Americans make a big song and dance about the fact that uh, they need to be the superpower because other, otherwise nobody will look after the global level. But that's, whether we like it or not, uh, I think we're moving into a world in which
which no one country or even group of countries is going to be able to manage the system in the way that we've got used to uh, over the past decades. As I'm suggesting, this is likely to be a more regionalized world because it will be culturally differentiated and power will be more diffuse within it. So there's a real question about how we think about global governance or great power management, if you prefer that English school uh, phrase. Uh, and that's why I'm using this term uh, deep pluralism. My big concern about the world in which we're moving uh, towards is that all of the prospective great powers that are likely to occupy this world um, are going to be autistic for one reason or another. Uh, by autistic, I mean that their behavior is going to be dominated by what goes on inside them rather than by a logic of interaction amongst themselves. Um, if you want to put this in international relations jargon, uh, they will be dominated by raison d'etat, uh, the reason of state, um, rather than by raison de système, the idea that it pays to make the system work. And there are uh, two reasons for this. Um, and it's important, I think, to, to, to get a firm grip uh, on this. I mean, to some extent, all states are autistic. You can make the proposition that, in general, uh, if you look at national elections, for example, uh, domestic issues, the domestic economy, tend to dominate electoral outcomes. By and large, citizens are not that interested in foreign policy. So most states have a kind of internal focus, and that tends to make them a bit autistic. Uh, but what I'm going to argue is that that tendency has become quite extreme right across the set of prospective great powers, and for quite different reasons. Um, for the established set of great powers, the United States and uh, uh, the EU and Japan, uh, basically this is a group of countries that are now tired. And they have been in the business of global management for some time. Um, you might argue they haven't done a very good job of it, but whether you think they've done a good job or not, there's no question that it's been incredibly costly. If you think of the uh, amount of blood and treasure that the Americans have spent uh, trying to maintain uh, global order over the, uh, the past while, uh, you can get the picture, uh, that these countries are, in a sense, a bit exhausted. Um, they no longer have the political will to provide global leadership. Um, if nothing else, the almost simultaneous occurrence of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump suggest electorates that no longer want to be taking responsibility for the rest of the world. Um, the EU is so beset with its internal differences and difficulties that it doesn't have much political energy. The, the EU has never been able to devise a coherent foreign policy or security policy, so by definition, it's inward-looking. Um, Japan is inward-looking for, uh, for uh, uh, different reasons, but it too is not going to be in the business of global management. So the old guard of great powers, while still around and uh, still being very significant centers of wealth and power have lost the will and in some senses have lost the capability uh, to continue on in leading uh, global management roles. If we look at the rising powers, uh, India, uh, China, and I think the same would apply to, to Brazil, we find a, um, the, same, uh, the same problem but for entirely different reasons. Uh, with, uh, with China, uh, and India, and I suspect the same would be true for Brazil. What's unusual about them as rising uh, great powers uh, is that they want at the same time to be recognized as having the status of great powers. They want that badly, right? uh, but at the same time they also want to hang on to their status as developing countries. Right? Now that's a very unusual combination that you've got great powers that are also developing countries. That just hasn't happened before uh, because the, uh, the necessary condition for being a great power for the last couple of centuries has been that you be a developed country. Now, what that means can be seen in the rhetoric that comes out of uh, China and India. And this rhetoric is surprisingly similar. 
um, I could steal a, a word from John Ruggie, um, exemptionalism, which he uh, rather nicely applied to the United States in the sense of the US liked to tell everybody else what to do and lay down all the rules, but then not obey them itself. So exemptionalism was the idea that the US was special and therefore should be exempted from obeying the rules. With India and China, um, it's a bit different, but the consequence is the same. What they say, and it's a perfectly reasonable and logical thing to say, they say, we are big countries, um, we are rising up, we are coming to terms with modernity, we are getting rich and strong, um, but we are still developing countries. We are old cultures and civilizations and we want respect for that. Um, we want, in some senses, uh, respect uh, as a consequence of our the sufferings we had during the, uh, during the colonial period, uh, the famous century of humiliation that the Chinese go, uh, go on about. Uh, so they, they're basically saying, give us this great power status, but don't expect us to do anything because our contribution is going to be to develop ourselves. We represent huge proportions of humankind, and if we can develop ourselves, that will be an enormous contribution to the welfare of humankind as a whole in terms of new wealth and power and knowledge and, and all of that. So don't give us any, res any managerial responsibilities. Right? That's still very much the rhetoric that comes um, out of uh, India and out of China. Uh, and that means that these rising great powers don't want to manage the world either. Right? So they are also autistic, albeit for somewhat different reasons. And this, it seems to me, is going to be a big problem in the sense that the, what that points to is an international society that is going to be undermanaged uh, because it's not going to, uh, not going to have uh, anybody willing to take the lead uh, or to jump in and spend their resources on uh, managing the world. Now, the difficulty is that in India and China, there is some tendency to celebrate this um, autism. I've mentioned the phrase Chinese characteristics, which you will hear if you, any of you study China, you will have heard thousands of times, and you will hear it thousands of times more. It goes with everything. It's like chips in, 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 in my country. You get chips with everything. In China, you get Chinese characteristics with everything. And that's basically a strong statement saying, we're not going to be like you. We're going to be like ourselves, and we're going to celebrate that. We're going to celebrate this difference. Um, in India, you get this uh, so-called Hindutva movement, the idea that the Hindu identity uh, and the Hindu culture needs to be made central to uh, the concept of India and Indianness. And all of this contributes towards this differentiation, cultural differentiation of great powers, um, and a tendency to look inward and to seek uh, one's own interests rather than the interests of the system. It can be argued that both India and China um, have rather weak foreign policy making machinery and that this is a problem. Uh, in the case of India, the foreign, uh, the foreign ministry in India is, is pretty good, but it's very small. It's smaller than, Sing than the foreign ministry in Singapore. And so India is just underpowered diplomatically in terms of taking any big role. The situation in China is a bit more complicated. Um, China's foreign ministry is notoriously weak. Uh, it doesn't have a strong place in, in the party hierarchy. Um, it doesn't have big champions uh, within the party. Uh, it is unable to coordinate foreign policy making amongst the many actors, including provincial governments, uh, the People's Liberation Army, the Coast Guard, the Fisheries Ministry, the state-owned industries, all of whom have their own foreign policies. But China's foreign policy is very poorly coordinated, which is strange because most people think, well, you've got a communist country, the one thing that you can expect is that things are going to be well coordinated and centrally managed, but in China, uh, they are not when it comes to foreign policy. There was some hope that the new National Security Commission set up a few years ago uh, would resolve this by putting um, all of the decision making in, in one place for a more strategic foreign policy. Uh, but in fact, this committee has largely concerned itself with domestic security, which in China means the security of the Chinese Communist Party. 
Um, China is an unusual place. The, the mandate of the army is to protect the party, not the country. I don't know whether it was ever like that in, uh, in this country during, uh, during communist days, uh, but it is a rather distinctive arrangement, uh, to say the least. So China is, and the Chinese Communist Party are much more obsessed with domestic security issues uh, than with uh, foreign policy ones. Another problem with uh, China and India is that uh, they don't really have any big ideas. Uh, the Chinese may be beginning to develop some big ideas, but so far um, both India and China know much more clearly what they're against um, and don't have much idea what they're for. So they're clearly against American hegemony um, and more broadly uh, Western domination uh, of international society and Western domination in uh, intergovernmental organizations. They don't like the fact that uh, in a sense, the existing rules of the game were set up by the West and the institutions that are part of that uh, were also set up by the West and tend to privilege Western powers and Western interests. And that's all fair enough. But what are they for? Great silence. We just don't know what they're for. Um, both of them seem to have an interest, particularly China, I think, could be thought to have an interest in regional primacy and being dominant in their own area. But beyond that, uh, there is, really isn't much clear thinking uh, that comes out of it. And even in terms of regional primacy, it's not clear whether that is going to be pursued in a consensual fashion um, or in some more hegemonic and coercive fashion. Both countries have problematic regions. Um, India doesn't get on with most of its neighbors and has a big history problem with Pakistan. Um, China doesn't get on with most of its neighbors and has a very big history problem with Japan. So these two regions are both poisoned by old historical issues, local issues, not to mention the kinds of history problems that stem from the colonial era between both of them uh, and the West more broadly. It's not clear from Chinese rhetoric um, exactly what the plan is for the region. Uh, I, I wrote quite a bit about this a few, a few years ago, uh, suggesting that China had uh, a choice between, uh, because it had a big rhetoric of, of so-called peaceful rise, or the, this was later changed to peaceful development, but the meaning was more or less the same. Um, the idea that China would rise in power without creating all of the uh, conflicts that earlier rising powers had experienced. So the Chinese had looked at you know, Germany and Russia and France and Britain and the US and others and seen that whenever there was a rising power there seemed to be big troubles uh, in the world of great powers uh, and they evolved this doctrine of peaceful rise specifically to address that. Uh, but there's room for questioning whether this was genuine or not or merely a clever tactical maneuver by Deng Xiaoping to cover the period in which China uh, was going to be relatively weak and vulnerable and dependent, as it were, um, on the rest of the world in order to uh, pursue its own development. That period is coming to an end now and it looks as if the rhetoric of peaceful rise is also coming to uh, an end with uh, China beginning to unfold now uh, a more uh, say, uh, aggressive, but certainly fairly hard-nosed uh, foreign policy. And it seems to be with uh, Xi Jinping's idea of the, the so-called one belt, one road, Chinese have an odd way of naming things, which may work in Chinese, but tends not to work in translation <laughs> very, very well. But it's essentially a continentalist strategy for unifying the, uh, the economy and the transportation infrastructure of Eurasia and therefore setting up a kind of counter to uh, what the Chinese see as the maritime strategy um, of the United States and the West which dominates the world from the, uh, from the oceans. So uh, any of you who have an interest in the old ideas of geopolitics uh, might well find this kind of thinking uh, arising again. So both India and China, um, th they share the same problem, that they are rising um, into a world that is still Western-dominated, 
uh, and they have to think about how to deal with that uh, and also how to deal with each other because one of the reasons that they're interesting to look at is because they are quite likely to end up being rivals in this world. There are some quite significant uh, issues uh, between the two of them. Um, India also uh, has, in some senses, a, a regional vision. Uh, mainly this is a vision uh, held by uh, the Indian Navy, which has curiously inherited the outlook of the Royal Navy from which it was derived when the Royal Navy was uh, ruling the roost in that part of the world. Um, India was its principal base, and its thinking was the Indian Ocean is ours. Right? We are responsible for everything from Singapore to East Africa. Um, and the Indian Navy thinks like that now. So there is some sense of a macro-regional vision uh, in India, although whether the country as a whole will warm to it uh, is an interesting question. The rise of China is, as I suggested, tending to um, integrate uh, Asia as a whole, uh, but the terms of that integration are not yet clear. In part, if the, if the one belt, one road policy works out, in part this will be an economic and infrastructural integration. Uh, but there's also a more negative kind of uh, strategic integration um, in which uh, those countries around China are beginning not exactly to balance against it, but to certainly to hedge against the rise uh, of China. So you find interesting uh, strategic partnerships. Nobody wants to say alliance because that would be too provocative, but a strategic partnership is low, fairly low key. And you find India, um, uh, in this sense, making strategic partnerships with Japan, uh, with Vietnam, with Australia um, and in a, a slightly different way with the United States, that kind of uh, shadow alliance, as it were, in case uh, uh, the rise of China turns threatening for everybody and they, and they actually need to, to balance against it. So Asia could be integrated in either of these ways. Um, India is finally getting some uh, strategic benefit from being a democracy. Although the United States had a big rhetoric about you know, making the world safe for democracy and blah, 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 this was of no use to India at all during the Cold War because India was seen to be neutral or even pro-Soviet and, and therefore the Americans on the whole had a difficult relationship with it even though it was a democracy. Now, however, um, India's democracy is playing more strongly in Washington. Uh, so you get a lot of this rhetoric about fellow democracies and the need to align, as it were, against the threat from a still totalitarian China. Indeed, an increasingly totalitarian China, uh, given uh, the current direction of the government there. So India and China have to figure out not only how to conduct their own relationship, but also how to conduct themselves in relation to uh, the remaining superpower, uh, waning though it is, it's still the remaining superpower. And what seems to be emerging is that China is increasingly conducting itself uh, against the United States, um, and India, although in a very cautious way, and not wanting to get drawn into any kind of US-Chinese uh, new Cold War, uh, India is tending to align itself uh, with, with the US. Um, I think the, the issue that I mentioned before is going to be a durable one for both of them. If they have to figure out how to combine their claims for recognition as great powers with their claims to retain developing country status. Now, um, China and India have both been fairly active in participating in international peacekeeping operations, so it's not as if they don't do anything. Um, but both of them, I think, are going to have to struggle uh, against the, uh, the possibility that they might slip into an autistic behavior, uh, denying responsibility for global management and letting, as it were, uh, the management of international society slip away so that actually nobody's doing it uh, and, and the whole system becomes undermanaged. This 
I, I think if you want an, ex an example of the dangers of this, this is exactly what the United States did after the First World War. And it went back into isolationism, said, don't bother us with responsibilities for global management, um, and what did we get as a consequence? Uh, world War II. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that we're heading towards a World War III because I, th I, don't, uh, I don't lose any sleep over that, uh, over that possibility. Uh, I think nuclear weapons have largely uh, taken care of that, uh, but it's nonetheless uh, uh, the case that the, the U.S. did make this error and it did have big consequences, and there's a real risk um, that China and India will do the same thing in their emerging period into, uh, into great powerdom. It still leaves open this question, um, what is their desired vision? for a post-Western uh, world order. Uh, is it that they're looking towards a balance of power system? Maybe. Um, that would be a bit disappointing if that's as good as it got. Uh, if you want grounds for optimism here, then I think the, the scenario to look at and perhaps to work for um, is what I would think of as a, a concert of capitalist powers. Uh, Probably you will need another title for that because the Chinese are not going to join anything which is labeled capitalist. I mean, the Chinese are capitalist, but you can't say that <laughs> in, uh, in, in, uh, in China. So you'd have, to, you'd have to figure out another name. But I use that term because I think uh, it's very important to emphasize the fact that because everybody is capitalist now, that actually does give everybody a lot of shared interest, most obviously uh, in not letting the global economy go, go to pop. The global economy needs to be managed and everybody is dependent on it in one way or another. Uh, capitalist powers do not want to see uh, big financial crises, they don't want to see a collapse of world trade, uh, they don't want to see uh, a breakup of the world into protectionist blocks. That would impoverish everybody. I think one of the great accomplishments of the, of the United States, um, and up to a point Britain, uh, but mainly the United States, was that the, uh, the capitalism that won the Cold War, and it seems to me that if you think about what won the Cold War, not who, but what won the Cold War, capitalism won the Cold War. Right? Liberal democracy did not win the Cold War, capitalism did. That's the only thing that has gone global and it defines a very powerful sh set of shared interests uh, because the fact that the version of capitalism that we have now is global capitalism, it's not the kind of imperial preference capitalism that one had uh, during the interwar years. That means that all of the players in the system do have quite strong interests in managing it, not just managing the global economy but also managing the various kinds of shared threats whether it be climate change uh, or internet uh, uh, security or defenses against global disease or uh, worries about rocks hitting the planet from space. These kinds of things are all strong shared interests and they are going to tend to get stronger. So there are at least plausible foundations to work against the autistic great power uh, hypothesis that I've put out here. Uh, in the sense that uh, there is a lot of shared interest and uh, if this shared interest goes unmanaged, everybody will suffer. And that many of these issues are not ideologically dependent because everybody is capitalist now. The global economy and the global market economy is not an ideological issue. It's a practical issue. How do we manage this uh, to our mutual advantage? I think climate change is another interesting example here. Climate change is not an ideological issue. It doesn't come out of liberal ideology or anything like that. It's a practical issue. If the planet is getting warmer, it's going to affect all of us. Right? So whether you're democratic or authoritarian shouldn't matter in relation to an issue like that. And indeed, if we leave out the somewhat bizarre and hopefully temporary behavior of Donald Trump, if you look at what happened in the, in, the, uh, in the Paris climate change talks in 2015, there was more or less agreement on what should be done. Mm -hmm.